Hello everybody and welcome to a brand new tutorial series on creating a blog like application using Python and using Flask. Now this is going to be a long series, probably somewhere between five to 10 videos and likely around four to five hours of actual recorded content. That is because there is a lot you need to do when it comes to actually building some type of blog. We're going to start by building out user authentication. So we're going to make sure people can sign in, create accounts, sign out, so on and so forth. Then we need to allow people to actually make posts so they can post something on their blog. Then we're going to have to allow likes, comments and kind of all the other things you would assume a blog app has. Now, this won't be a completely fully finished, super feature rich application. But after going through this tutorial, you will learn a ton about web development with Python. And we're actually going to write zero JavaScript in this uh, this video series. So my goal here is to make everything work with simply Python. So you only need to know Python. You don't need to know JavaScript. And with that said, let me give you a quick demo of the application that we're going to be building out. So as I said, we're going to be doing this in Flask with Python. You can see this is kind of what the blog looks like. I'm not focusing a ton on styling, although I will make things kind of look somewhat organized on the page. So we can start by creating an account where we can log in. I'll just make an account. I'll go with Tim at gmail.com. We can just go Tim as the username and then password. I'll just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, submit. You can see we've created our account. It brings us to the home page and we can see all of the posts that people have kind of put out there. So I'm treating this as kind of like a social media slash blog website. So you can see all the different posts. You can see the number of likes. We can like a post by simply pressing on the like button or we can comment on a post. Right. So you can see all of the comments this post has. We'll just say hello, comment. And then notice hello is here. Now I can press on someone's username and I can see all of the posts that they have. And I can obviously like and unlike posts. So that's kind of the basics of this. Uh, you can also make a post. So hello, this is a test post. OK, let's make a post there. And then notice it tells, you know, post created brings you back to this page and then you can see all of the posts. So that is kind of the basic idea. This is what I'm going to be showing you how to create. I hope you guys are excited. If you are, make sure to leave a like on this video, subscribe and let's get into the video. All right, so let's go ahead and get into it. The first thing I'm going to state is just a few prerequisites or things you should consider before you go try to follow along with this for four or five hours. So first of all, this series is not designed for beginners. I do tend to explain almost everything that I'm doing. So if you are a beginner, you'll probably be able to follow along, but that's not kind of the intended audience. This is meant for people that have some experience with Python understand maybe a little bit about web development, HTTP and HTML. We're going to be writing a lot of HTML here and a lot of Python, but no JavaScript. So you don't need to know JavaScript. Usually for web development tutorials, you need to have some background in that. Regardless, that's kind of all of the prerequisites. Next, what you need to do is get some coding environment. Obviously, you need to have Python installed. I'm going to be using Python version 3.8. You can use any version you want that's above 3.6. That should be compatible with this tutorial. I'm also using VS Code to write all of my code in. I prefer this for kind of larger projects and stuff that has HTML because I can use auto formatters and extensions and stuff that I'm going to show you how to set up right now. Regardless, use whatever you want, download VS Code, and we can go ahead and get started. So I'm inside of a folder here. I've opened this up in VS Code. The first thing I'm going to do is create a new folder. I'm going to call this website. This is where all of the code related to our website is actually going to go. Next, I'm going to make a file. I'm going to call this app.py. This will be kind of the entry point of our application. All right, now what we're going to do is just configure VS Code. If you're not using VS Code, you can skip this part, but I'm just going to install a few extensions that are going to make our life a lot easier as it relates to formatting our code. So I'm going to install an extension called Prettier. Actually, this is the only one we're going to install. So if you go to the kind of uh, extensions marketplace here in VS Code, it's this icon that my mouse over type in Prettier and then press install. This will now allow you to auto format your HTML code. I'll show you how that works later on. Anyways, that's kind of the only extension that you need. All right. Now what we need to do is install some Python packages related to the modules we're going to use. So I'm going to open up my command prompt. If you are on Mac or Linux, open up your terminal and we are going to use pip to install the following packages. So first thing you should do is try to make sure your pip command is working. So go to your command prompt or terminal, type pip 
and see if it is working. If this doesn't give you any output or it says this command is not found, I have two videos on my channel that show you how to fix this command. If you guys are a subscriber of this channel, you've probably heard me say this about a million times. I'll leave those videos in the description. They show you how to fix the pip command. But something you can do in case that's not working is try Python 3 hyphen M pip. See if that works. You can then try Python hyphen M pip. You can try Python hyphen M pip 3 or you can try Python 3 hyphen M pip 3. Now, not sure if those are going to work for you, but you can try those out. OK, so once your pip command is working, what you're going to do is type pip install and you're going to start with Flask. This is the web framework that we're going to be using. It's a lightweight Python web framework. You can see I already have it installed. Next, you're going to install. This is going to be Flask SQL Alchemy. I don't know if the capitals matter or not, but I believe that's how you spell it. Flask SQL Alchemy. Yes. OK, so that is correct. So install that. And then finally, after that, we are going to need to install Flask login. This is going to help us with uh, authenticating our users and having them stored in a session. And I'll talk about that later. on. OK, so that is all we need. All, our, all of our dependencies are installed now and we can actually start creating our first Flask application. So what I'm going to do is go inside of my website folder here in VS Code and I'm going to create a new file. This is going to be called init.py. So I'm going to have two underscores. So underscore, underscore, init, underscore, underscore, dot pi. And before I go any further, I should mention that if you're getting lost here or there's just some code that's not working or something, all of the code that I write in these videos will be on GitHub. I'll leave a link in the description. But for each video, I'll have a separate folder on GitHub for all of the code in that video. So feel free to stop, pause, look at that, copy and paste. That will probably be important, especially when we start writing a lot of HTML. OK, so we're inside of our init.py file, and this is where we're going to start writing kind of the initialization stuff for our Flask application. All right, so first thing we're going to do here is import a few modules. So I'm going to say from and Flask import with a capital Flask. I'm then going to say from Flask underscore SQL alchemy import, and then this is going to be SQL alchemy like that. Uh, I think I spelt this incorrectly. Yes, I did. OK, let's fix the spelling. Alchemy, alchemy looks good. Then I'm going to say from OS import path. We're going to use this later on. And finally, I'm going to say from flask underscore login import and then login. Oops, if I can get my capitals right here, login manager. OK, nice. So we now have all of the imports that we need. Now what I'm going to do is create a function. I'm going to call this function create underscore app. And what this is going to do is create a Flask application and return it. You'll see why we need to do this in a minute, but I'm just going to code out a lot of this and then we'll kind of walk through it step by step. So inside of here, we're going to say app is equal to and then Flask and then it's going to be underscore underscore name underscore underscore. This is how you create a Flask application. This is the first thing you need to do whenever you're making a Flask app. You do app or whatever the name of your app is going to be equal to and then flask and then you put name. Now name is referencing the name of the module that you're going to be running to create this app. Don't really have to worry about it too much. This is kind of just what you do. Now, after you do this, you need to configure a few variables for Flask. Now, you don't have to do this, but it's a good idea to do this. The first thing we need to configure is what's known as our secret underscore key. Uh, this is a key that we're using, I believe, to hash session data or to encrypt session data. Again, you don't have to worry about it too much, but you need some kind of secret key here. You can make this literally whatever you want. I usually just do something like hello world. And obviously in production, you don't want anyone to know what the secret key is. But since we're just going to be kind of running in debug mode here for Flask, uh, we can make this whatever we want. All right. Now, all I'm going to do is I'm just going to return app for right now. I'm going to show you how we can run our Flask app. So this is actually all we need right now. Uh, there is some more, but we'll do that in a minute. What we're going to do now, though, is go to app.py and notice that app.py is not inside of the website folder. So the reason I put this init file inside of website is because this makes this folder a Python package. Now, this means that from any other file, I can actually import this folder. And when I import this folder, it will give me all of the stuff inside of init.py. So it's kind of strange if you haven't seen this before. But what I can actually do is say from and then I think it's just website. It might be dot website. I need to look at my cheat sheet here. No, it's just website import create underscore app. So I have this folder here called website. It has this init.py file in it, which makes it a package. That means I can directly import the folder name. And when I import the folder name, everything inside of init.py runs. So that means I can actually take 
create app right from website because it's from the init.py file. Hopefully that makes sense. But now I have this create app function. So what I'm going to do here is say app is equal to create app. And I am going to say app dot run and then debug is equal to true. So whenever you are running your Flask application uh, and you're like programming it out, you're debugging it, you're developing it, you put debug equals true. That means every single time you make a change to your Python code, it will automatically rerun the Flask web server. So you don't have to manually keep starting and stopping it. However, before I do this, I'm just going to do an if statement if statement here. So I'm going to say if underscore underscore name underscore underscore equals and then this is going to be a string underscore underscore main underscore underscore, then we are going to do this. Essentially, what this does is make sure that we actually ran this app.py file, not that we imported it from something else and then it had this code run. OK, so now we can actually start our Flask application. So what I'm going to do is open up my VS Code terminal. You can obviously do this from any terminal that you want. And I'm going to type Python app.py. Now, you also could just run this file by pressing the run button, but I like to do it from the terminal. So I'm going to go Python app.py, and then you should see that it starts the Flask application. So if that doesn't work, just make sure your code looks like this and that you have the folder and your init files name the correct thing. And now what we're going to do is copy this link right here. So it says running on HTTP 127.0.0.1. This is just localhost. By default, it will run on port 5000. If you want to change the port, you can say port equals and then you can just change the port to whatever you want. OK, regardless. Uh, OK, I need to rerun this because I had a syntax error. But now I'm going to go to that link. So this is actually the link right there. I'm going to refresh. Uh, OK, one second. I have another instance of this running. I just need to. <laughs> OK, so I had a different instance of the Flask server running. That's why you were seeing the blog. Anyways, I fixed that. Just refresh and then you should see you get something like this. This is fine. This means this is working. If this link actually works like you go somewhere, that's good. It says not found. The requested URL was not found on the server. That's fine. We haven't added any URLs to the server yet. And so obviously we're not going to find anything. All right. Nice. So what I'm going to do now is show you how we can create what's known as a view or kind of a root. Now, a root is just like slash home slash page slash profile, whatever. We need to manually create these different routes that we can go to or endpoints. So what I'm going to do inside of here inside of create app temporarily is I'm going to say app or sorry, it's going to be at app dot. And then this is going to be a root like this. I'm going to put a slash. This is the actual route that we would go to in the URL kind of address bar. And then I'm going to say define and I'm just going to call this home. So this is kind of the way that you create a flask route or something that's going to show something up on the screen, right? An endpoint. You do at app dot root. You do the actual name of the route. Then you define some Python function and this Python function needs to return something. So in this case, I'm going to return some HTML. I'm going to return h1 h1 and hello. So now if I go to slash, it should actually return this H1 tag. So I should see hello popping up on the screen. So if I go back here and I run this now, oops, I need to rerun my Flask server because I had a syntax error. So if I rerun my Flask server, I go here and I refresh. Notice we see hello. Pretty straightforward. Now, if we wanted to make another route, we would just copy this. We would go here. We would say slash and then I don't know, let's just go slash profile. And we need to change the name of the function, obviously, so it's not the same. And then here I could just go profile. Nice. So let's rerun the application and let's refresh. Let's now go to slash profile and notice this is working. So those are the two routes that we've created. OK, so I just wanted to show you that in case you're not familiar with Flask, that's how you create roots. Now, I don't want to create roots in this way. I want my code to be a little bit more organized and I want all of my kind of views or roots to be in a separate file. So I'm going to set up something called a blueprint. So the first thing I'm going to do is make a new file here. I'm going to call one views.py. I'm going to make a new file, another one. I'm going to call this auth.py. Now, auth.py is going to have all of the uh, roots story related to authentication. So log in, sign up, sign out, etc. And then views.py will have all of the views related to our core blog applications like the home page, the uh, user's profile page, whatever, the create a post page, all of that will be inside of here. So we've just separated them out. So what we need to do, though, is we need to create what's known as a blueprint. So inside of views.py, uh, we can start here. I just need to look at my little cheat sheet to make sure I don't mess this up. We're going to say from Flask import, and then this is going to be a capital blueprint. And then what we're going to do is say views is equal to blueprint. 
we're going to pass the name of our blueprint, which in this case is views, and then underscore underscore name, underscore underscore. Again, don't worry about this too much. You just need to pass this. And this is the name of our blueprint. So you're going to say views variable is equal to blueprint. Put the name of your blueprint. This should mirror this variable name here. And now what you can do is just like we did before, you can say at views dot root. And in the same way that we did previously, you can make a root. So here I can say define home. OK, and then I can return. And in this case, we won't even do a tag. We'll just return. home. Nice. So that is how this works. OK, now the thing is, we've created this file. We've created this blueprint, which is really just a place where we're going to be storing different routes, but we have not linked it to our Flask application. So inside of init.py, what we need to do is actually import this right here, this variable, and we need to register this blueprint with our Flask application. So to do that, what we're going to say is from uh, this would be views. Sorry, this is actually going to be dot views import and then we're going to import views like that views is this variable so if you name that something else you would import that or you would change that name there and then we're going to say app dot register and then underscore blueprint and we're going to register the uh, views blueprint and the prefix for this blueprint is going to be a slash now i believe we actually have to do url underscore prefix is equal to slash so what I've just done here is I've said, OK, we have this blueprint. It's in this views file. We've imported it. We're going to register that blueprint with our app. And the URL prefix means, OK, all of the roots inside of here, what are they going to be prefixed by? Now, in this case, I don't want any prefix, but let's say I had, you know, slash home, but I wanted you to have to go to slash API slash home. Well, I would make the prefix slash API. And now if I wanted to access this, I would need to type in my address bar slash API slash home and any other root in here. I would need to put slash API before it to access it. So that's what the URL prefix is, but we don't want a URL prefix. So I'm just going to leave it as slash. All right, so let's rerun this application now and let's see if this is working. So I'm going to rerun. I'm going to go here. I'm going to refresh. And notice this has not found. I believe that's because I make the root slash home. I did make it slash home. So if I go to slash home, you can see now this is showing up. All right, so we've registered the blueprint for this file. Now we need to register the blueprint for auth. So we're just going to copy everything inside of here. We're going to go here. We're going to change the name of this, obviously, to be auth, auth. And then that means that this needs to change to auth. And for now, we can just make like some basic login or sign up route. So let's change this to login, login, and login. And then we'll copy this and we will make uh, sign up. Oops, sign up, sign up. OK, and we will make sign out. All right, sign hyphen out or log out. I actually like log out better. I'm kind of using a combination of sign and log, but that's fine. OK, so we need to change the name of these function obvious, obviously. So let's make this sign underscore up and let's make this log out and then let's change these accordingly. So sign up and log out. OK, so now that we've done that, we need to register this blueprint as well. So we're going to go back to init.py. We are going to do a similar thing. We're going to say from dot auth import. And then this is going to be auth. And then we will register the auth blueprint again with no URL prefix. So we're just going to put auth like that and we are good to go. Now, the reason I need a dot here is because I'm doing a relative import. Now, what that means is since I'm inside of a Python package and I want to import a file that's also inside of this Python package, I need to put a dot before it. If you're not inside of a Python package, you don't need the dot. If you're inside of a Python package, you do. And so that's why I'm doing the dot. It's known as a relative import. I won't explain it too much, but that's kind of the rationale behind putting that there. OK, so let's look here. Uh, let's rerun our Flask application and let's refresh and let's try some other endpoints. So log out. OK, that works. Sign up. Nice. And then finally, log in. Or did I go sign in or did I do log in? I think I did log in. Uh, oops, why did that not work? OK, log in. Nice. Log in works. Perfect. So now that we've done that, I want to show you how we can actually render some real HTML onto the screen because we've set up a few routes. We can now access a few different pages. But obviously, we don't really want to just be showing some basic text. We want to show some actual HTML. So that is where this function render underscore template comes in from Flask. There's this function. 
It's called render template. This allows us to render an HTML template. Now I'll discuss what that really means in a second. But in order to do this, we need to make a new folder in our website folder called templates. So we're going to go templates like that. And this is where we're going to put all of our HTML. So we'll have some HTML files. We will render these HTML files from our roots, which means they'll be returned to whoever called it. So we'll actually see that on the screen. So inside of here, let's make a template. Let's just go with a super basic template for right now. And let's call this one home dot HTML. And actually, I'm just going to go back to auth. I'm going to copy render template. I'm going to go to views and I'm going to do it inside of here. So now what I want to do is I just want to have some kind of basic HTML here so I can actually show it on the screen. So there's a little shortcut here in VS Code. If you type HTML colon five and then you hit tab, it gives you a boiler boilerplate, sorry, HTML template. Uh, you don't have to do that, obviously, but I like this. It saves us a bit of time. So I'm just going to change the title quickly to say home. And for the body, I'll just do an H1 tag and I will just say home. So now we should be able to actually render this HTML code assuming we do it properly inside of a render template. So let's go back to views. Now we now have our uh, home.html file inside of templates. It's very important you create this templates folder. If you don't make this templates folder, this is not going to work. Flask knows to look for templates inside of the templates folder. And well, you just you need to have a templates folder. So all we need to do if we want to show that HTML is instead of returning some string, we're going to return render template and we're going to render the name of our template in this case home.html. So when I do this flask knows to look inside of the templates folder, it will find home.html and then it should show it on the screen. So let's go here. Uh, I think I'm probably going to need to rerun my flask app. Oh, no, it's still running. OK, good. Let's refresh. Let's go to home and uh, sorry, this has to be slash home. OK, and there we go. Now we are at home. Now I'm just going to show you something because notice how slash brings us here, but slash home brings us here. Now, ideally, I want if we just go to the base URL. So if we don't have slash home, it shows us the same home page. So both home and slash go to the same place. So to do that, I can simply add another one of these here right above this and say at views dot root and just give it a slash. This now means if I go to slash or I go to home, it will bring me here. So now if I refresh, see, it's bringing me to the home page. All right. So now we have a decent grasp of how Flask works, at least the basics, right? Showing some different pages, navigating around. What I'm going to show you now is what's known as the Jenga templating engine. So the reason why we're not going to have to use any JavaScript for this application is because Flask has this Jenga templating engine, which allows us to write some kind of Pythonic related code inside of our HTML documents. So the way it works is when you render a template, notice this is called an HTML template. You can actually pass variables to this template. So I can do something like name is equal to Tim. Now, when I do this, this actually allows me to access this name variable from within the HTML template that I'm rendering. And the way you do this is let's just go like this is you put two sets of squiggly brackets and now you can access any variable that you pass through when you render this template. So if I go here and I put name inside of two sets of squiggly brackets, the templating engine knows that this is a variable. So it looks for it uh, being passed when we are rendering the template and then it actually shows you the value of this variable. It kind of evaluates the expression. So since I pass name equals Tim, if I refresh now, you should see that Tim is showing up. Now, obviously, if I change this to like Joe, OK, let's save, go here and refresh. We get Joe pretty straightforward. We can pass multiple variables and we can do a lot more than just work with variables. But this is kind of the cool thing is that we can pass information right from our back end to our front end by just passing it through when we render the template. So if I go back to home.html, I'm going to show you a few more things we can do in the Jenga templating engine. One of the things we can do is write if statements and for uh, four blocks or four statements or four loops, <laughs> whatever you want to call it. So whenever you're doing some type of statement, like an if statement, a, a for loop, I think you can do a while loop. There may be a few other things you can do, but those are the only ones we're really going to use. You do the squiggly bracket percent percent and then squiggly bracket. So I'm going to write an if statement. So I'm going to say if and I'm going to assume some variable in here is going to be name. So if name is equal equal to Tim, so just like you would type it in Python, then underneath this, you put whatever you want to appear. So in this case, I can just show maybe hi. Actually, I think I can just do this. Hi, Tim, exclamation point. And then you need to end the if statement. So you're going to go percent percent and if. 
So not quite like Python because the indentation doesn't matter here. This is how you make a basic if statement. You do if condition, whatever you want to appear if this is true, and then you end the if. Now, if you wanted an else, you could go percent percent. Oops. OK, and you can do else and then you can say uh, not Tim or something. OK, so now what we can do is we can pass through a name. So we are passing through Joe and let's just refresh this and see what we get. So notice it's saying not Tim. But now if I change this to Tim and I refresh, we get hi Tim. There you go. So that's the basics. That's how you do an if statement. All right, so now moving on to for loops to do a for loop is pretty similar. You're going to do four and then you could do something in something, right? Or something in range, just like you would do in Python. Some stuff is a little bit different here in Jenga templating. I'm going to refer you to the documentation if you want to do anything super specific, but you can do something like this for X in and then you can make a list and maybe go one, two, three, four, and then you end the four. So n four now inside of here, this will act just like a normal for loop. So what I can do is this and this means I'm going to show the variable X, which is defined here. So let's do this. Let's go and refresh and notice I get one, two, three, four. So it's showing each one of the values here, right? Pretty straightforward. OK, so that is how you do a four. So that is cool. But there is one cooler thing that I need to show you, and this is called template inheritance. So the cool thing with Jenga is that you can actually have templates inherit from other templates. So what this kind of means is you can create a base template, something that maybe has the nav bar, the footer, some things that are going to be persistent and constant across your entire application. And then you can define some blocks inside of that template that you want to be overridden by maybe other pages. You'll see what I mean in a minute. But what this allows you to do is create a base for your website and then have all of your other pages inherit from that base template and then add into it as they please. So you can kind of imagine like all of this stuff is always here, right? And then maybe there's a div here. And this div is kind of where the content of specific pages is going to go. Well, with Jenga, you can do this. You can make this work. So I'm going to change this template here to be base and show you what I mean. So I'm going to say base.html. This is going to be our base template. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to start setting up a few blocks that can be overridden by child templates. So I'm going to go here. I'm going to go percent percent. I'm going to say block and then I'm going to put the name of the block. So in this case, this is title. And then I'm going to go percent percent end block. Now, what this means is that I can actually override this block and sorry, this should be end block in another template and whatever I override it with will go inside of here. So if in another template template, I write block title end block and then I like put hello or something, it will show up right inside of here. So it'll be the title of my website. That's kind of the point of this. So I'm going to copy this now. And I'm going to do the same thing down here. And I'm going to call this block content. OK, so let's get rid of this home and this is just going to be a content block. So now same thing, whatever I put inside of the content block in a child template will go inside of here. So this is my base template. What I'm going to do now is create a new HTML file and this is going to be home dot HTML. Now, the way I use this base template here is I extend it. So I say percent percent extends and then this is going to be base dot html make sure you put that inside of a string so now what this means i have to put this at the very top of my file here is that i'm going to use all of the stuff inside of here and i'm going to put stuff into this template by accessing the different blocks that it defines so i'm going to copy my block title i'm going to put that there i'm going to copy my block content and i'm going to put this here so now i'm just going to make the title home and for my content, I'm going to write a little bit of HTML. So I'll go H1, H1, and then I'll go, hello, this is a test exclamation point. OK, now when you save it, the auto formatting is kind of weird. It doesn't handle the Jenga stuff really well. So you'll see it kind of looks all janky like this. Uh, if you want to not automatically format your code on save, you can do control shift P that opens the command palette in VS code. And then you can say file save without formatting. So if you just go format, it should show up here. So save without formatting and you should just be able to press that and you'll be good. OK, so regardless, this should now work. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to refresh my page and notice it gives me hello. This is a test. Now, just to prove to you that this is actually using this base.html template, I'll go above this div here. So not inside of block content and I'll put an H1 and I'll just say hi. 
So now when I do this, you should see that we have hi and then hello. This is a test. So hi will always be here. And then whatever I put inside a block content, well, that will fill this diff. I assume that probably makes sense now. That is how template inheritance works. And that's a super, super useful thing. So what we're going to do is we're going to create a few more templates. We'll just write all of them and kind of, you know, have these blocks as we need them just to save us a bit of time later on. So I'm going to copy everything inside of here. Notice I just have the extends. I have my block title and I have my block content and I've ended all of the blocks. I'm going to make a few more files. First file I'm going to make is login.html. I'm then going to make a new one. This is going to be signup.html. We'll make another one. This is going to be called posts.html. Some of these I will not get to until later videos, but I'm just going to make them for right now. And then we will make a create post dot HTML and this can have an underscore. All right. Let me make sure that's all of them. Uh, da, da, da. There's one more that we need here, and this is going to be called post underscore div dot HTML. And we'll look at that one later. OK, so inside all of these, I'm going to paste my kind of starter code because all of these templates are going to inherit from the base template. So let's put that there. Let's put that there. And let's put that there. Nice. We now have all of our HTML files created that we'll need for the block. OK, so now that we've done that, we need to start looking at authentication and start actually setting up some real web pages uh, on our uh, Flask application, right? So I've showed you the basics of Flask. Hopefully you're comfortable with it now. We're going to start working on creating a few pages. So sign up, log in, you know, sign out, all of that kind of stuff. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go inside of my base template and I'm going to actually bring in a CSS library called Bootstrap. Now, Bootstrap is a very basic CSS library that allows you to use some built in classes. So in this tutorial, we won't have to write any CSS because I hate CSS and I would much rather just use some pre built CSS from a library like Bootstrap. So the way you do this is you go to the Bootstrap website. The link will be in the description and you are going to go and look for this JS deliver thing. OK. So notice how it has the CSS only and then it has the J uh, JavaScript bundle with popper. So what we're going to do is we're going to take both of these. So I'm going to copy this here right from the home page of getbootstrap.com. And I'm going to paste this right above the title in my head. So this is a link to a CSS style sheet. I can delete that comment there. So now I should be able to use CSS styles or sorry, bootstrap styles. So that's good. Let me zoom out here a little bit so we can see. And we're going to now go and we're going to take the JavaScript. So I'm going to copy this. OK, where is it? Copy. And I'm going to paste this at the bottom of my body. All right. So you paste uh, you place the script tag at the bottom of the body and you put the link tag uh, somewhere in the head, preferably above the title. But it doesn't really matter where you put it. Nice. So now we should be able to use some bootstrap classes and we are going to start creating a nav bar and just some basic you know, styling for our website. So we will continue in one second, but I need to quickly thank the sponsor of this video and the series, which is Algo Expert. Algo Expert is the best platform to use when preparing for your software engineering coding interviews. They have 160 coding interview practice questions taught by the best instructors, one of which is me. Get started with Algo Expert today by clicking the link in the description and use the code tech with Tim for a discount on the platform. All right, so buckle up. This is where we are going to be writing a lot of HTML. Uh, there will be a lot of HTML in this tutorial. Again, if you don't want to write all of this, you just want to copy it. You can go to the link in the description and just copy and paste it all in. But I will go through it and explain to you what I'm actually doing. OK, so let's delete this H1 tag. I'm going to leave this div here for the content. We'll fill this in in a second. We're going to start by just creating our nav bar. So we're going to create, I actually believe the tag is simply nav and this is going to be class is equal to and this is going to be nav bar and then nav bar hyphen expanded hyphen LG standing for large and then nav bar hyphen dark and then BG hyphen dark and then we're going to end this nav tag. All right, so these are a lot of classes. Now, these are all bootstrap classes. Now, the way I find these classes, obviously, I have this code out already. I'm just copying it from another screen is I go to the bootstrap documentation. So if you go to bootstrap and you press on this docs button right here, you can see all of the different uh, kind of pages of classes that they have. So they have components, forms, content, layout, etc. So here I've pressed on nav. So where's nav? Nav is navs and tabs. Oh, sorry, nav bar is what I want. So I go to nav bar and then notice it shows a bunch of different versions of a nav bar. So if you scroll down here, this is actually a very similar nav bar to the one we're going to be creating, except it won't have any search button here. 
and notice it has navbar, navbar dark, bg dark. And if you go back and look at our code, that's exactly what we have, except we have this expanded thing. What this means is that when the screen gets so small, the nav bar will kind of be shrunk into, you know, those three little lines. When you press those three little lines, it's like a button. You see this on mobile a lot. It like expands the nav bar down. So I'll show you how that works in a minute, but I just wanted to show you that's where I'm getting the classes from. So if you're wondering, like, how does this guy know all of these classes? I don't. I literally just copy them from the Bootstrap website. I try to create something that looks kind of somewhat nice uh, and that's at least like laid out properly on the screen. OK, so that's what we need for the nav bar. Now what we're going to do is create a bunch of stuff in the nav bar. So I'm just trying to figure out where to get started here by looking at my cheat sheet. So I'm going to create a div. This is going to be class equals to container hyphen fluid. This just adds some padding around the container so that it's not like stuck to the side of the screen. It's like padded off a little bit. And then I'm going to make a button. So I'm going to say button. And this is going to be the button that allows us to expand the nav bar when it's shrunk down and the screen is a certain size. So I'm going to say class equals and then it's going to be nav bar. Oops. Hyphen toggle. And this actually toggler. And then we're going to say type is equal to button. We're going to say data hyphen BS hyphen toggle. And this is going to be equal to collapse. Then we're going to say data hyphen BS hyphen target. And this is going to be equal to pound nav bar, which is the ID of the content for our nav bar, which we'll define in a second. So there you go. That's our button. Now, inside of this button, we need to put a little icon. So I'm going to say span class is equal to, and this is going to be nav bar hyphen toggler hyphen and then icon like that. And then we're going to end the span. So that will show a little uh, icon for our actual button that we can press on. OK, so now outside of this div here, but actually, is it outside of this div? Uh, no, it's inside of this div. Sorry, we're going to make another div. And this is going to be the div that is going to have the content for our nav bar. So we are going to say class is equal to collapse. So this means it can collapse down. Right. And then we're going to say nav bar hyphen collapse. And then we're going to end the div. And then we're going to give this an ID. We're going to say ID is equal to navbar make sure that this here and this match so that when you press the button it actually toggles this to collapse or not collapse the nav bar. nice now inside of here we're going to say div class is equal to and this is going to be navbar hyphen nav so this is that the actual navigation area and then we are going to put a few links that will be on the nav bar so we are going to say a class is equal to and this is going to be nav hyphen item and then nav hyphen link like that. And then we're going to end the tag and we're going to say href is equal to and this is going to be slash home and we're going to put home. All right. So you guys are probably familiar with a tags. The href is where you're going to go when you press on this link. So that's what this is. And by doing the nav item nav link, it looks nice in the nav bar. So we can copy this a few times. OK, and for now, we'll just go with login or sign up. OK, and then we can change these appropriately. So this is going to say log in and this is going to say sign hyphen up. Nice. OK, so now we have some sort of a nav bar. So you can kind of get the idea of our nav bar right here. That's what we just coded out. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go and refresh my page and notice that now we have a nav bar, right? And we can expand the nav bar by pressing on this little button. Now, by default, I want the nav bar to be expanded. So I'm just going to figure out how I mess this up quickly and show you how we can fix that. All right. So I found the error, just a little bit of a typo here. Notice how it says nav bar expanded LG. That should just say nav bar expand LG. So change that from expanded to expand. Again, all the code will be available on GitHub in case I'm losing you here. All right. So let's refresh now and uh, come on refresh. Oh, I need to make this larger. Now notice when I make it larger, we see all of the links in the nav bar. When the screen is smaller, then it collapses the nav bar. So you can kind of change the behavior of that. I'm not going to go through how that works. But if I press on login, it brings me to log in. I press on sign up, brings me to sign up. Home brings me to home. Perfect. OK, so now that we have the nav bar, what I want to do is I just want to make these other uh, like sign up login pages actually work properly, because now when I go to sign up and log in, it's not showing the correct page. Right? It's not showing the nav bar on those pages. 
So I'm going to go to auth.py and I'm now going to rather than return login, sign up, log out, I'm going to render the templates we've created. So I'm going to say render underscore template and then the name of the template for login is simply login.html. OK, nice. I'm going to copy this. We're going to do the same thing now for sign up. So sign up like that. And then same thing for log out. Actually, we don't need a, uh, a template for log out. Sorry. So here when we log out, I'll show you a little trick. We can actually redirect the user when we go to this endpoint to go to a different endpoint or to go to a different page. So I'm going to import something. This is going to be redirect. I'm also going to import URL four and I'll discuss how these work in a second. But I'm going to return a redirect to the URL for and then I'm going to say views dot home. Now, the reason I'm saying views dot home is because I want to go to this function right here, the home function. I'm referencing the home function, not uh, not the root or the endpoint here. I'm referencing the actual function name. Now, this blueprint is called views. So for me to access this function here, I need views dot home. So I'm saying, OK, let's redirect the user to whatever the URL is for views dot home. The reason I do this is because I might change the URL in the future. So I could theoretically just go like slash and that would work. But then if I changed the URL or I removed slash here, this would no longer work. So this is a more dynamic and better approach. You go URL for and you write the function name because you're not going to be changing the function name, but you might change the root. OK, so now that we have all that, let's go here and refresh and let's see if the nav bar now works. So when I go to log in, I go to log in, sign up, sign up and notice it's showing me the uh, what do you call it? The nav bar the entire time. OK, so now let's just create, say, the login page. So let's go to login.html. Let's first change the title here to say login. And now let's start coding out some forms for the login page. All right, so we're going to go inside of our block content here. Let me just make this look a little bit nicer. We're going to define a form. So we're going to say form. We'll say method is equal to this is actually going to be post. Uh, and that's all we need for right now. I'll discuss what that means in a second. But essentially, that means when we press the submit button, this is going to send a post request to the endpoint that we're currently on. So to the login page rather than a get request. If you're unfamiliar with those, don't worry. As soon as we get to the next video, we're actually going to be handling uh, like data being sent to our back end. I'll discuss what all the HTTP methods are. OK, anyways, inside of the form, what we're going to do here is put an H3 tag. I'm going to say a line is equal to center. Uh, pretty intuitive, but this means whatever I put inside of here is going to be in the center of the page. And I'm going to say login. OK, then I'm going to start creating a form group. So I'm going to say div class is equal to form hyphen group. And this is where I'm going to put all of the fields that I need my user to fill in. So since we're logging in, all I actually need here is going to be uh, let me think of this, a email and a password. Yes, that's all I need. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create my label. So I'm going to say label for equals email. And then this is going to say email address like that. I don't need the colon. I'll end the label and then I'm going to make my input. So I'm going to say input. Got to spell input correctly. Oops, the input tag is just ended like that. Sorry, I'm going to say type is equal to text because we're going to be typing in text. I'm going to say the ID is equal to email. OK, and then I'm going to say the name is equal to email. Now, it's very important that you put both an ID and a name. The reason we need a name is because when we are actually sending this data to our back end, we're posting the login information. Uh, this is how we're going to access that data from the name field. So make sure you have a name and an ID. OK, so type ID name. Do we need anything else? Uh, I think we need a class. We're going to say class is equal to form hyphen control and placeholder. That's what we need. Placeholder is going to be equal to email or enter email. OK, there we go. So now we have our input. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to copy this and we're going to do the exact same thing, except now it's going to be for password. So I'm just going to change wherever it says email to say password. And I'll change the type from text to password. When you change the type to password, that means you can't see what they're typing in. OK, so let's change this to password. Uh, password and then for the placeholder, I guess I can just say enter password. Nice. OK, so now 
no, I don't want password address. I just want password. OK, so now we should have a form for logging in. So if I go to my login page now, let's refresh and let's go to login. Notice we get our email address and we get our password. But this does not look very good, right? It's kind of expanded all the way to the edge of the screen. We need to fix that. The way we're going to fix that is by actually going to our uh, home or sorry, our base template. And we're going to add a class to the div that holds all of our content. This class is going to be equal to container hyphen fluid. So if you do this, you add the container fluid class to the div that holds your block content. And now you refresh. Notice that we get this padding off of the edge of the screen. But still, this is not great. Can we make this go in a bit further? Yes, we can. I'll show you how we can do that. So I actually just made a mistake. <laughs> I was wondering why it was so far to the left. We need to just have this be container, not container fluid. If I do this now and I refresh, that looks a lot better, right? It's taking up less room on the screen. Still not the best login form in the world, but that's good enough for me, to be honest. OK, now we need a button that we need a submit button. So let's go to login and let's add a button. So I'm just going to put a break here. So I'm going to say BR like that. And then I am going to make a button. So I'm going to say a button like that. Class is equal to BTN and then BTN primary. Now, when you do this, you if you add the BTN class, this just formats the button. It makes it look nice. And then you can change the color with BTN hyphen and then the name of different colors. Uh, some colors are secondary, primary, dark, danger, success. Uh, you can probably guess what colors they are. I think there's a warning as well. Warning would be yellow. Danger would be red. Primary is like a nice blue color. So that's what we're going to use. And then here I'll just put actually rather than submit, we can say log in and we will do type is equal to submit. So this means that when we actually press this button, it will submit the form and post this data to the endpoint that we're on slash login. Let me see if there's anything else that I need here. I think that that is good. Yes, that looks good to me. OK, so let's refresh now and notice we now have a login button. However, this login button is not in the center of the screen. I would like it to be in the center of the screen. So I'm going to put a div here. I'm going to say align equals and then center. And then I'm going to take my button. I'm going to put it inside of the div. And now this should be in the center of the screen. So let's refresh. There we go. We're now in the center. So align equals center. Easy trick in Bootstrap to make stuff go in the middle of the screen. Nice. So that is our login page. Let me uh, zoom out so you guys can see all of this. Now, what we're going to do is copy this login page, actually, and we're going to put it for our sign up page. The reason we're going to do this is because we just need to add a few more uh, labels, right? We need like a username. We need a, a password confirmation. They need to type it twice. That's actually all we need. So we'll just copy what we have here, our label and input, and we'll just make one for username and another one for password. So here. I'm going to copy this and rather than email address, I will say username. Obviously, I need to change a few things here. So username, 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 and then enter username. OK, uh, we can go a capital U here and then let's copy password. So I will actually make this password one and then the other one we have will be password two. So this will be enter password again. Oops, we'll say password again. And then this will be password two, two and two. And that needs to be password one. OK, so I think that's good. And then here I'll change this button to say sign up. And then we have this H3 tag that says login. This will be sign up. And the title of our website or web page here will be sign up. Nice. OK, so that should actually be it for the sign up page. So let's refresh and let's now go to sign up. And there we go. We now have our sign up page. Perfect. So I think with that, I'm going to leave this video here. I know this is a long video. I did a lot, but I told you there is a lot to do for this website. There's a lot of stuff that we have to get through in the next video. We will handle all of our authentication. So we have our form set up. Now we need to actually have it. So when we press the submit button, it sends this data to our back end. We can look at that back end. We can create a user, save that in a database, validate that it's logged in or logged out. We got to do all that stuff. So we'll do that in the next video. If you guys enjoyed, make sure you leave a like, subscribe to the channel. I'll see you in another one. Thank you.